impressive collection of Art Deco architecture that includes many different building types. As seen in these photos taken by Glenn Rogers, who many of you know, and he's here at the conference. He's over on the right. Wave, hey, Glenn, in case anybody doesn't know you. And we have collaborated on many lectures and articles. These buildings include skyscrapers, smaller commercial buildings, single and multi-family residences, government buildings, and even some churches. <laughs> Many of these buildings are well-maintained, and a number of them have been restored and repurposed. But sadly, others have been destroyed or drastically altered, and still others are threatened by demolition or neglect. Today I want to share with you some of Chicago's Art Deco preservation success stories, failures, and current threats. I'm going to begin with the failures so that I can uh, end on a more positive note with the successes. The late Paul Gap, who was the architecture critic at the Chicago Tribune for almost 20 years, called the demolition of this building, the Michigan Square building, Chicago's greatest deco loss. An announcement of the project in a 1928 issue of the Tribune reported that it would be the tallest and the most expensive investment on Michigan Avenue, north of the Chicago River. It would be designed by Halliburton Root, a Chicago firm that designed many of the city's Art Deco buildings. And it would be constructed in three phases, an initial eight-story base, followed by a 17-story addition, and then by a top portion of a height that was yet to be determined. The first phase, which you see here, opened in 1929. But because of the economic downturn that followed the stock market crash of that same year, the building never went any further. Michigan Square fronted on Michigan Avenue, and it occupied an entire city block. It was a elegant uh, but restrained classical modern design with a base covered in Belgian black marble and the upper floors in buff Bedford limestone. Ornamentation was sparse, but the tenants could design their own storefronts, and they were encouraged to be very creative. And you can see some examples in this photo to the right of the entrance. And here's a closer look at two of them. The Socatch Bakery on the left was covered with red and gray terrazzo, and the wall bookshop on the right had a white metal facade. The two-level recessed main entrance to the building, which you could see here at the center, opened onto a shop line corridor that led to a dramatic semi-circular space at the back of the building called the Diana Court. The court was surrounded by two levels of upscale shops that could be reached by a system of ramps and floating staircases. The focal point of the court and the feature for which it was named was the Fountain of Diana by the Swedish sculptor Carl Millis. At the top is a bronze figure of the goddess of the hunt clutching her bow, and water cascaded from two marble urns into a circular basin where we don't find mermaids and dolphins like we did at the Vagabond, but instead nymphs and satyrs. The, um, there, there were nine etched and sandblasted glass panels with images of Diana designed by the Chicago artist Edgar Miller that were set into the top 
of the curved uh, rear wall of the court. You can see them in place on that photo on the left. And here on the right is one of those panels. That's not a Glenn Rogers photo. <laughs> That's one of my photos. It's very difficult to get good images of these panels because as you'll learn later, they're glass and they're behind glass. In 1945, Time Incorporated purchased the Michigan Square Building to house its subscription services division. In the late 1960s, after Time had outgrown the space, it was acquired by an investment group that demolished all but the structural steel uh, frame and replaced Michigan Square with this hotel, which the American Institute of Architects Guide to Chicago Architecture described as a faceless, graceless clunk. Although Michigan Square is gone, some remnants of the Diana Court remain. Two of uh, Edgar Miller's glass panels are in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. And the Fountain of Diana is now on the campus of the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. The Esquire Theater is another Art uh, Deco preservation failure. Paul Gap in 1982 described this theater as one of Chicago's handsomest theaters and among the city's best examples of Art Deco. The Streamline Modern Theater, which opened in 1938 on Chicago's fashionable Oak Street, was designed by brothers William and Hal Pereira for Elmer and Harry Balavan, the youngest members of the Balavan family of show business entrepreneurs. It was called the Esquire to give it the same aura of sophistication as the Chicago-based Esquire men's magazine, which had debuted in 1933. The 1,600-seat auditorium was located to the east, and that's to the right in this photo. It was expressed on the exterior by a convex pale yellow brick wall with a rounded fluting or pleats, and the wall was topped with a pink charcoal gray polished rainbow granite parapet. That same rainbow granite covered the rectangular projection to the west, that's to the left here, which contained, I think I have another image of this, which contained the uh, ticket booth and the lobby on the lower level and their offices and mechanical equipment above. The name Esquire was spelled out in neon on the marquee and in incandescent bulbs on the vertical sign. The streamlined modern design continued in the kidney-shaped lobby, which had pendant light fixtures that resembled the planet Saturn with its rings. In 1986, the Commission on Chicago Landmarks recommended landmark designation of the Oak Street facade of the Esquire. Shortly after that, the Commission allowed a developer to divide the two upper levels into six small theaters and to convert part of the two lower levels into retail space with a separate entrance. And you can see the changes that were made at that time over on the right. In 1994, uh, eight years after uh, the landmark uh, recommendation, the uh, proposal for landmark designation finally reached the Chicago City Council and it was rejected because of the extensive changes that had been done to the building. More drastic changes would follow after the theater closed in 2006, as you see here. And today it's an upscale retail complex there's very little left of the original theater. You can see a little bit of that brick wall near the top. The parapet is no longer random granite. 
the vertical sign remains, which just seems rather ludicrous to me, and the letters from the marquee are now on display in the ground floor vestibule of the uh, restaurant that occupies the upper levels. I want to move now to the threats. The Union Station powerhouse is one of Chicago's Art Deco buildings whose future remains to be determined, but right now uh, it doesn't look very promising. The um, powerhouse opened in 1931. It was designed by Graham Anderson Probst and White to generate and supply power to train-related uh, buildings and infrastructure. It's located, located on the south branch of the Chicago River, just south of Union Station, and you can see Union Station over on the uh, right. It's not a very, it's, it's quite modest in size but there's tall, narrow, rectangular windows. Give it a strong vertical emphasis, which is accentuated by those tall smokestacks. The building has not been operating since 2012, and Amtrak, the current owner, would like to demolish it and replace it with a storage and maintenance shed at a cost of nine to $13 million. But before federal taxpayer funds can be used to do that, Amtrak must provide evidence that all efforts to uh, use the building for another purpose have been exhausted. Preservation Chicago, a local advocacy group that is heading the campaign to save the building, has suggested that it could be used as a control or data center, but right now uh, most uh, preservationists in the city think that it's going to be lost. I'm more optimistic about this building. The Laramie State Bank, although the, although the situation is still more this building was threatened for about the past 10 years, but recent reports suggest that it might be saved. It opened in 1928 in the Austin neighborhood on Chicago's west side. Its polychromatic facade and Art Deco ornamentation distinguish it from the gray stone neoclassical banks that were more common at the time. Let me go back. Um, no way. Uh, the facade is covered with terracotta in shades of mustard, yellow, celery, green, and cream. The columns that flank the entrance are filled with cascading coins and industrious workers. You see that on the left. And the capitals contain images of squirrels and bees and uh, owls, which are symbols of thrift and industry and wisdom. The relief above the entrance shows a family surrounding a bowl that's overlaid with fruit and stylized eagles perched on globes, uh, villa spandrels on the side of the building. The Laramie State Bank didn't last very long. It closed in 1930 at the start of the Depression. For a while, some New Deal agencies had their offices here. And in the mid-1940s, another bank took over the site, and it remained here until 1991 when it became insolvent. A few years later, the bank was purchased by a longtime Austin resident who hoped to restore the building, but the cost proved to be prohibitive. It was used for a time as a banquet facility and as a restaurant and a retail space, or rather office space. Um, but um, it um, was then foreclosed on, and it stood vacant for about 10 years and it deteriorated because of deferred maintenance. In 2018, a portion of the roof collapsed, and this is what the interior looked like at the time. But there is hope because uh, there is now a plan under a City of Chicago initiative to re, uh, restore and redevelop the bank,
It would once again become a bank, as well as a cafe, and a blues museum, and a business uh, incubator. There are also plans to construct a residential building with 78 units of mixed income housing on a vacant lot adjacent to the bank, and you see that in this rendering. The bank has now been stabilized, and last November, ground was broken on, uh, for the residential portion of the project, which is the first that will be completed. So I am hoping that in the future, I can include this building among Chicago's Art Deco preservation success stories, like the Chicago Motor Club building. The Chicago Tribune called this building the city's first art modern design. It was completed in 1928. It's another Hall of Vernon root design. It's not exceptionally tall. It's 15 stories. But the continuous um, um, piers, the vertical elements of the building, and the recessed spandrels, the horizontal elements, and the narrow width emphasize its verticality. There are frozen fountains in the cast iron pat, um, panels above the entrance. And the facade is decorated with stylized birds and geometric patterns and floral motifs. The club's touring bureau was located in the lobby. And signage, which remains today, directed members to the appropriate location, depending on what part of the country they wanted to visit. Here are some of the silver gilded moldings from the lobby, and the light fixtures, which consist of frosted discs topped with uh, light bulbs. And the high point of the lobby was the mural above the elevators designed by John Warner Norton. It shows the major automobile routes in the country at the time that the building opened. In the uh, mid-1980s, the Motor Club moved to the suburbs, and its former headquarters remained an office building for the next 20 years. In 2004, it was vacated for a planned residential conversion that never materialized. So nothing happened here until 2016, when it was acquired by a new owner who um, began restoring the exterior and the lobby, including the mural. And today, it's a Hampton Inn. And there's a 1928 Ford Model A parked in on one of the balconies overlooking the lobby. The old main Chicago post office, which as you can see was the new post office when this postcard was published, but now it's the old post office and it is one of Chicago's most recent Art Deco preservation success stories. It was designed by Graham Anderson Probst and White, the same architects uh, that designed the Union Station power plant. It's a classical modern design, and when it opened in 1932, it was said to be the largest post office in the world. This remained the city's principal mail processing facility until 1996. That was almost six decades. And then the postal uh, service moved to a new, updated, more efficient facility just to the south of this one. After that, the building stood vacant for about 20 years, although in 2004, it was used as the Gotham City Police Department in the movie Batman Begins. In 2009, a British developer purchased the building um, at auction and announced a grandiose plan for its redevelopment, but uh, it never materialized. And then finally in 2016, it was acquired by a new owner who began converting it to an office and event facility. The redevelopment of the building involved the removal of asbestos, lead paint, and mold, the installation of new electrical and mechanical systems, 
and the replacement of all of the windows, and there are a lot of windows in this building. The white marble clad walls of the lobby were cleaned, as well as the metal, the metal plaques near the top of the wall, which depict various means of transporting the mail. Here you see the Pony Express. And the Art Deco lanterns in the lobby were refurbished. Today, beyond the lobby, excuse me, today beyond the lobby, there's a multi-story atrium with lounges and a food court. It was dramatically lit for a, an event that occurred in February of 2020 showcasing the development. And that image on the right is a stylized eagle that's the logo of the project. Little did I know that this would be the last major event I would attend for more than two years. The pandemic slowed occupancy of the building, but today, uh, PepsiCo, Uber, Walgreens, and Cisco Systems are among the tenants, and events are once again being held here. And the building now has a park on the rooftop with a running track and basketball, pickleball, and paddleball courts. So I hope that in the future there will be a lot more art deco preservation success stories like this one. Thank you. Thank you.